Um, so, uh, all right. So first I had to take off the, uh, the chewy outfit because that fur, I mean, it's cold up here too. Like we just had snow and I was, I was burning up towards the end of that interview. It was, I was hoping Chewy wasn't going to pass out while we were trying to get through that. But so, um, Hi, and welcome back to another episode of Intentionally Left Blank. I'm Brandon Williams. I'm the Innovation and Strategy Manager up in Eagle County, Colorado. And uh, clearly, we are recording on May 4th. Hey, everyone. Uh, this is Lilo with Governor's Office of Information Technology. Uh, yeah, today is May the 4th, and, you know, we're, we're ready. We're rocking this, so... <laughs> All right, today, today's a really fun one. Um, so I was a history major in college, but I was really only qualified to sell Lafayette bobbleheads out at Yorktown. Um, but today we are here with somebody who has not only studied history, but continued in history. Um, and it's Shannon Haltevanger from Colorado History. And uh, since it's May 4th, we're going to keep the theme of discussing things that happened uh, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away and talk about uh, a little bit of Colorado history and maybe some of the past, but also the future. Uh, so, Shannon, uh, you want to tell us a little bit about kind of how you got I'm particularly interested in how you actually stayed in history since I had to like float around and find my way in the world. Um, but if you could talk a little bit about uh, how you came to History Colorado and uh, your role there. Yeah, so um, I'm happy to be here and happy to talk to you. Too. I think it's been a long time coming that we've talked about history forever. But so I'm Shannon Holtwanger. I am currently the director of evaluation an impact at History of Colorado, which is a actually a pretty fun job to say the least. It's you know we've really been looking at the trying to true impact that history organization can make on on the state, and especially when we kind of bridge our different departments together because we're not History of Colorado is in Drexel Museum. We're also we have you know seven or eight community museums across the state. We have the off, the State Historic Preservation Office and the State Historic Preservation Fund, which is a great grants program. And then we also have a, you know, celebrating, the grants program is actually 30 years old this year. So that's kind of cool. And it's it's making history. And then, you know, we have our state collections, which, you know, some have referred to as, you know, your the your grandmother's attic on steroids, but um, it really is, you know, like the state's collection. We're collecting the state's history for everything from paper to, to 3D objects. And I think, my role here has completely changed since the first day I walked into History Colorado as their preservation communications person. And my background is actually in art. So my undergrad was in art. I'm an artist by nature, which is really fascinating and I love that. And then I worked as an artist for you know five, five plus years doing textile design until I started seeing these different communities that were shutting down because their industries were leaving. And I was trying to figure out, like, what happens to towns that were built on industry? And what happens when that industry change? How does that evolve? And so I ended up stumbling into historic preservation and realizing that there are so many great towns across the globe that have you know, reinvented themselves through heritage tourism and really relying on the history of who they are and what their, you know, what has always been there in their land. And so, and that kind of got me into grad school in New York in historic preservation. And then about 12, but a little over 12 years ago, I moved out to Colorado because I really loved the innovation that we were taking with preservation and sustainable development and really thinking about the environment and our building. Because in preservation, we say that the greenest building is the one that's already built because they didn't have AC. So they were contemplating airflow throughout the, to, to lose and deal with harsh winters. So that's kind of how I got into History Colorado in their communications office, because the one thing that's, that historians don't always know is how to not speak in long form. And we're, we're used to writing, you know, thesis statements. And so, you know, until Twitter became a thing, it wasn't, um, we, we couldn't speak short. And so, um, and so now we, now we do. And we now, you know, historians across the globe are kind of banding together to kind of 
let people understand and realize the importance and the value of history. And, and so that's kind of how I got here. What's been interesting about this work is that it's at the state level, right? So like we're, we have another layer of responsibility, I think, as, as, as humans, as, as government employees, as, as public servants, as civil servants. And that's to really kind of not only take care of our, our communities, culture and history and you know and preserve it so that future generations know about these different time periods but also you know it's state finances it's tax revenue it's you know we have an obligation to the people of Colorado to kind of take care of that money and use it wisely and and so we hope we do that every day but I think that's what's been interesting about being history Colorado is a nonprofit and a state agency. So it's this really interesting balance that we've had, that we live with of how to how to balance that because we do have, we are grant funded, we are donor funded, and we're also get revenue from, uh, tax revenue from the gaming towns in Colorado, which is another like interesting dive that, you know, takes, you know it's fascinating if you love how money flows at state level. So that's kind of, in, and what I do now is really looking at you know, what is a true impact that we make when we go into a community and when we work with communities? And so what is our overall like health, equity, and social impact? You know, we have this belief and desire that history can be. And that once you understand and name the history and you understand it, then you can, you know, become better, more informed citizens and make better decisions about the future. And, you know, it's not just about looking at the past, it's, you know, it's, it's learning to use it to, to better this world, right? And we, and so it's another one of like, I can't remember who originally said it, but it was like history, history doesn't repeat itself, it just rhymes a lot. And I think we see that a lot over this last year that everything that's happened. Nice, that's, yeah, I mean, like the, the stuff that, the History Colorado Center does um, is, is pretty wild and I mean you kind of mentioned it too with like the funding and like how money flows through um, from agency to agency right and I think that's <clears throat> that's super wild at least for me from like a nerdy how, where does the money go kind of situation um, and you kind of mentioned a little bit uh, currently but like what do you what are you working on right now in your current role um, that is uh, that you feel is transformational for uh, either History Colorado or for the uh, for the state as a whole? I think one of the things that I've been most fascinated about this past year is really looking at our overall impact. You know, we used to, we have program evaluations where, you know, we do surveys to, you know, our, our educators to find out how they like the program. You know, we do, you know, we interview visitors to how they like this program, but you know, when you're looking at us with History of Colorado, we have the preservation side and we have the museum side and we have the collections piece, right? And then we have our community museums. But how holistically is that work impactful? You know, what are some common themes that we start to see? Because then we can get down to, you know, setting goals and expectations of for ourselves that we can try to drive and focus on. You know, we have a big goal at History of Colorado right now, and that's um, that we want to serve or impact and um, engage with 1 million people a year and that's in person and so you know like the thing that i've been working on really is how do we break down that and you know we have in-person impact and then we have you know our resources and our research documents that people come in and watch and you know, either watch videos or look at old reels or use the collection that's kind of a different that's kind of like an interpersonal, like it's an independent engagement, right? So it's not us dictating a time or place or, you know, what the curriculum's going to be. It's just like, here's our stuff, come look at it. You know, there's that impact. And then there's the social aspect of social media and how that plays a role in, in gravitating people to communicate with us. And so I've really been looking this past year at that, in, you know, that, you know, that um, interpersonal engagement and how our, how we, are impacting the lives of others, but how they're impacting us and helping us learn about what works for us and what doesn't and what they need. You know, it's been, there's a project that's coming up that our educators are working on that I'm super excited about. And that's really creating this online portal for teachers to be able to get 
um, resources online that, um, you know, based in STEM cell, you know, it's based in STEM learning and it's based on core curriculum. And, you know, and they've been, we've had that all along and we have this great digital badge program, which tracking the data on that has been super fun of just like, you know, with parents that are struggling with kids, you know, at home learning or hybrid learning and what the and teachers having to come up with different lessons and things like that. And so our education department is working on putting some really cool stuff together that'll go online that really like impact that. And then also they've been doing a lot of virtual field trips and where you can actually get to our youth ending museum if you're in Denver and you can actually like talk with an educator at youth ending museum. And so that's been kind of fun to see the data come in from that to see like what are people gravitating towards? What do they need right now in their life? And so that's been kind of the fun part of my job over COVID is really kind of diving into that, those, those data points and finding and helping our staff learn from what they're doing and learn how their work is connected to another department's work within our agency. And I think that's, you know, a lot of times there was, that wasn't happening, but I think with COVID, what's been nice is that they've been able to kind of start to see how they are, how their work is impacting these big goals that we have of serving 1 million people in. And so that's been, and you know, it was, it was hard um, at first because we had such a great year uh, last year, at, at, up until this month, uh, last year, we were like really on track with meeting some really big goals that we had. And then we kind of had to pause and kind of shift and, you know, recenter what we were doing and what we were thinking. And so it's, and we spun up a whole bunch of virtual programs because of that. But what's been great is seeing that growth and seeing those staff growth numbers, because we have small museums across Colorado that probably can only hold like 30 people for a lecture that now are doing great talks that they're seeing like 200 people attend. That would never happen if it wasn't for COVID. And so, you know, it's trying to find out what's working and what is sustainable. And that's been what's been fun about my job right now is looking in that data and providing data points to our leaders who are making these decisions to find out what, you know, what can work in the future. And we've been lucky enough that the museum network is, we're all pretty connected across the globe. And so we've been having these conversations about how can we set up better tracking points for them as a, as a, you know, as a whole across the U.S. about like how, and even in parts of Europe about, in Canada, about like how museums are learning from this time. There was this horrible statistic that I, I keep hoping is not true, that at the start of COVID, it said about 80% of all museums would probably close um, by the end of COVID because of just, you know, different things like that. I'm hoping that that does not hold true because I've seen some amazing stuff come out of other data scientists at at museums of just trying to figure out how to better analyze this work so that we can help our leaders who are making these decisions be able to kind of have data to back them you know and that's kind of the big shift that i think is happening right now is using the analytics that we have to help us make better decisions about how we can better serve you know I'm, people that rely on us yeah i think i'm i'm really fascinated i mean I, History Colorado has has done so much. Living in rural Colorado, the opportunity for my kids to have read books with the History Colorado, you know, executives uh, through YouTube, to engage with a lot of the historical, um, not only the images but the documents and a lot of the data and the, uh, the the stuff that's not sitting in the museums. I think you've done such an amazing job of bringing history from the past into this technological future. And I'm really fascinated when you were just talking about the museums collaborating and coming together. I'd be curious if, if you had that kind of crystal ball and looking into the future, how are you organizing based upon COVID and some of the tools you have now, how are you positioning, you know, uh, work with your staff, the preservation staff that are in the field? How are you organizing some of those data collections to bring even more online? And, and where are you pushing some of those boundaries in education to be able to integrate with teachers uh, and bring classrooms? So it's, it's, really open. I'm, I'm just more curious about where you want to go. Yeah, and uh, we, you know, I think our education staff has really done this great job of really working with teachers to find out what they need 
And so we've been able, they put off a lot of teacher resources, lesson plans, and kind of um, and hearing from them on what can make their life easier, which has been really nice. And I think, you know, that pushing the boundaries is, you know, when our staff have to get in front of a camera and teach students, you know, like take them through the museum and come up with like a fun experience that's just as engaging as if you were on a virtual, if you were an in-person field trip. But there's also so much other things going on that are doing that. And our preservation staff is, you know, we've um, been doing paper processes for permits for years, you know, and that's, you know, it's um, a little known fact that if you're going to put up a cell phone tower in Colorado, you're probably going to come through our office to check to make sure that you're not going to possibly do your reversible harm and damage to, you know, the history of that area. And so, and, and a whole bunch of other things, I'm, they'd probably, laugh at me for streamlining it that easily but they're and those guys work those folks work so well together and are really trying to help others be able to get the documents that we have online because that's our hardest part right now is that those legacy documents that haven't been scanned that haven't been uploaded that don't have the right systems to be able to do searches and what what is needed and that's kind of you know, been a goal before COVID because we try to, anytime there's a natural disaster in Colorado, we try to, we have these great maps, you know, we have this great GIS data points that allow, you know, our first responders, you know, in, in the emergency centers to know where some historic resources are. And so that way, if they can get out there, we can kind of help protect them from the fire. And our grants program has really been working on different avenues to help in those directions with grants that we have, especially emergency grants and tax credits. So that's been interesting to see how they're evolving and putting stuff online. I think if I had a crystal ball, I think that the thing that I would love the most is if more state agencies started working in partnerships. You know, I see, I've seen, I've been on so many calls where we have different agencies that we're all in the same town, right? We're all in the same towns trying to help these individual towns and we could probably and our budgets are very small and they seem to you know sometimes shrink sometimes grow but they're pretty much don't really move the needle a lot and if we could come together and as as government to do good and kind of work together and see what we're working on in different communities you know so for example this rural broadband that's been out there that we're trying to fix we have community museums in some of our most rural parts of colorado We've turned, you know, we, when we were in person, we were working on a project to get us better, you know, broadband in our museums. That is something that we can afford that costs right for us to be able to pay our bills, but then could also serve as a place for students to do online, to do, you know, fill out their college applications. And so, you know, it's just when you think about all the things that state agencies do, what would happen if we all decided to work together to improve um, the lives of a community, you know, together, you know, and like really focused our attention, you know, in these different avenues and, and into one town. And we have that, um, I'm hoping, I, I applied for a grant, I'm hoping we get it so we can do this study of um, this group down in, you know, San Luis is one of the most beautiful parts of Colorado. and. And we have done a lot of work in San Luis that is um, from State Historical Fund grants to our Museum of Memory projects to our education project. And, you know, we we were curious of like, does, do we actually help communities in relationship to their overall economic growth when we're there? And what happens if all state agencies started thinking that way and started really looking at how can we come together and make a difference in the community that is not overpowering or overbearing but it's working with the community it's listening to the community on what their needs are and really helping us figure that out whether it's our farmers in rural colorado who are struggling with drought syndromes or too much rain or not having their crops grow to you know our buildings that are sitting empty and vacant and landlords that are trying to figure out how they're going to keep the building because industry isn't there to, you know, and to like, what's the history of the area? And, you know, I fully still believe that history can heal in communities if, if we want it to. And if we, and that we can actually be better people, a better government if we actually work together. God, I love that. All right, so we got the mystery fourth question coming in because it is May the 4th. 
Um, favorite th top three rankings of Star Wars movies. And I'll go first because I've got a I've got a controversial one here. Obviously, the original Star Wars. I then have Rogue One, which I think was such a breath of fresh air. And then I actually got a wing in Solo. And and I think Solo, your hot Star Wars controversial opinion. Um, I think Solo suffered because Leia flew through space. I think it was so close in time that I think there was a little saturation and I think, I think it was hard to look at Solo objectively. I've watched it several times since and as a standalone, uh, <laughs> I, yeah, I, I actually believe that, that Solo is, should rank higher in, in the order. Um, so anyway, all right, Shannon. Okay, so um, I can I, I can appreciate those answers a lot. Um, I actually like Solo as well. Uh, my favorite is still always going to be Empire Strikes Back. I think um, I think it was a defining moment for Gen Xers. I think uh, you know it was probably most of our first Star Wars that we ever saw. And you know I remember playing it as a kid in my backyard with like I was the only girl on the block, and I refused to always be Leia. <laughs> and, um, and just because, and but it was, you know, I think I've seen that movie so, so many times that it has to be my top, my top Star Wars movie. Um, I actually liked Rogue One too. Uh, I, you know, like I, I really thought that they've done a good job with some of the, the newer Star Wars movies that they have of kind of reliving that like feel. And, you know, I even kind of, you know, love Star Wars Rebels and you know in the Clone Wars and have we'll watch those time and time again and um but I think it's my love of animation and love of Star Wars that all kind of came together and was, was great but and then and then um you know I think I don't know if Solo would be my number three but it would be in my top five <laughs> nice that's awesome that's a that's a that's a solid list um Let's see if I think uh, if I were to do my top three, uh, I would actually have to say number one would would probably have to be same as yours. Actually, Empire Strikes Back. Uh, I never saw it in the theaters, um, but the I mean the the classic revelation slash twist that's become very cliche of you know the main protagonist being the father of the or the main antagonist was the father of the protagonist. Like just, right, is my, my my young kid mind just like, oh, what? He's, that can't be his dad. <laughs> He's such yes. a bad guy. Um, like right. that was my, that was my big thing. Um, I think uh, my, my number two film would probably be Rogue One as well. Uh, I think Rogue One was such a, it was such Rogue a well done diversion yeah. from the rest of the Star Wars universe where there was like there was like force adjacent powers which was cool um, but there were no yes. lightsabers um, right no Skywalkers popping in to save the day um, it was it was like pure story driven almost like wartime epic movie yeah uh, which I thought it was, was gritty awesome. Star Wars just gritty and raw Star Wars yeah right yeah that's exactly it um, and then my third one, uh, I'm, I'm probably going to catch some some flack for this one too. But my third one is actually probably going to be the Last Jedi. Um, the Last Jedi, yeah, made, like okay, flipped the All whole right. narrative around. And I'm, I was sad that um, Rise of Skywalker didn't continue this flip, but um, okay, it was such a it was, it was so great because like you had, you had Mark Hamill who was like. I, you know, the Jedi Force should die, and the Jedi should die, and he, like, like, him yeeting the lightsaber over his shoulder was just, like, yeah. so awesome. Like, I'm like, this is such a great, uh, like, a great statement piece. Um, and then, of course, the, the throne room battle scene was just fantastic. Right. Like, I, I thought that scene Gotta was Gotta go with that. So, yeah, number three for me would have to be The Last Jedi. <laughs> strong. It's strong, and I, I appreciate the justification. Yeah, right. <laughs> Well, cool. Well, thank you so much, Shannon, for taking time uh, to walk through history and, and the future uh, with us. And so 
Um, super excited about where Colorado history goes next. Yeah, me too. I can't I can't wait to see where we go. I think it's a, it'll be, you know, I think that there's some great things that are happening in museums right now, and especially history museums. And they're faced with a lot, you know, and they're faced with them. You know, we've been collecting the stories of, you know, it's not me, but uh, um, members of History Colorado have been collecting the stories of COVID during this time. And, um, you know, Lilo even helped us set up so that we could make sure that we were able to collect stories. And so it's just been, you know, we make history every day. And it's kind of, you know, the role of historians right now is hard, you know, it's hard sometimes because you're processing your own history, you're processing the world around you and everything that's going on that's been happening for, for years and that it's finally coming to light for many people and also dealing with the pandemic and capturing those stories. So, you know, it's like history doesn't ever stop. And I think that's the one great thing about history museums right now is that they are continuing the story. You know, you're no longer walking into a museum and stories stopped 50 years ago. We are telling the stories of right now, happening right now in the context of our past at the museums. And I think that's what is exciting to see for a change. You know, there were three takeaways that um, I thought were really interesting, especially from her perspective coming from a, a, a history museum um, and one that's affiliated with the state. I mean, obviously, the energy that she's got around the integration and education programs, um, you know, fourth graders in Colorado focus on Colorado history, really bringing the remote museums and all of their um, libraries and stuff online, yes but yeah. online in conjunction with educators and right. being able to yeah. develop curriculums and lessons plans. I just, that, that warms my heart. And uh, I really love seeing that kind of initiative and effort there. Yeah. Um, I think that number two and three were actually both sort of tied, um, but they both center around the work that Colorado history does with other departments, you know, as a museum that's under the umbrella of the state and closely affiliated with so much state activity. I thought it was really cool the way that they coordinate on like emergencies, incident response, and also just local efforts when they team up with like local affairs and, and other um, departments that are doing local work to make sure that historic preservation and uh, consideration towards historic locations and sites is, is it remains a focus even right. during uh, a response <clears throat> or, or just as as construction or other things are happening yeah i think sure. closely related with that though is shifting from the past to the future was really her when when shannon was talking about looking at um using the museums and some of those public spaces and some of the locations that the departments have to be able to help other departments start to think about remote work, alternative mm -hmm. work spaces and opening up the museum so you can have other departments come in. You'd be able to use that square footage in some different ways for remote workstations. Um, and, and I just thought that was such a unique idea of how to get dual use out of some of those spaces. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think like to that one specifically, like um, being able to then kind of uh, use that as a source of additional revenue for the museum um, yep. where you're renting that space out for the different agencies. I mean, I think that's such a brilliant idea. And I really hope that, you know, that gets moved forward because I, I know I really liked working from the History of Colorado Center uh, more than yeah. more than working from my traditional building. So um, cool. Um, yeah, and yeah. It, even even on that, you know, one of the things, if we look over the horizon with the shift that's going to happen, I don't know, nobody knows exactly what it's going to look like, but remote work is a thing and, it, and it's yeah. a thing that's now rooted. And if we start to look at an inversion of how some, you know, offices and local and state governments work, focusing on in-person days as being collaborative days mm -hmm. or team building days, and to be able to use a museum in a space like that for that kind of team building and exposure. Yeah. And, and I just, yeah, there's some exciting things uh, going on there. Yeah, no, I, I totally hear you. And um, History Colorado was primed to do that. I mean, they've got just amazing yeah. spaces for that kind of collaborative work. So 
Um, you could ski yeah. jump and get work done. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Have It'll you done the twofer. digital ski jump at the at the Colorado here? Yeah. Yes, that's sir. Cool. That's, it. that's it. Is it the steamboat, the House and Hills? Uh, yeah. Hills? So yeah, cool yeah. stuff. <laughs> uh. Awesome. Um, yeah, so my three uh, kind of spin on those same things, right? So like economic growth and development. So, um, mm. you know, the uh, the museums were pretty wildly impacted um, because of the pandemic. And, uh, you know, the way that the money kind of flows from the gaming areas and then pushing that into History Colorado to help fund that program, um, you know, really kind of fills in that, that monetary pathway. Um, but then because they like didn't bring in like the same uh, people revenue, trying to figure out the other ways to sustain and maintain that building um, lends itself really well to like we were just talking about the collaborative workspaces. Yeah. Right. Um, the second thing is uh, the, the interpersonal side of the museum. So like the traditional aspects of museum life where it's like you go in, you tour the facilities, you check out the exhibits, you look at the objects, um, but having to literally spin on a dime uh, to now switch this over to something where it's like more virtual or predominantly virtual um, and then having like their education department like you said kind of focus in on um, different types of educational programming instead of having kids come into the museum giving them access to like uh, virtual materials or um, you know digitized documentation that kind of stuff like this was such a smart maneuver for them and uh, it really brings yeah. Um, you know, history to life for those kids that even can't, that can't go to the museum, even outside of pandemic times. Right. Um, and then uh, the last one that, that really stuck with me that Shannon kind of brought up was the fact that history is constantly changing or history is constantly being made. Um, and so we're sitting in like this really weird time, right? Where now we've got this pandemic and there's like stories behind the pandemic. Um, and then History Colorado is trying to capture those stories um, for preservation purposes because this isn't something that, you know, isn't as widely available as like, you know, back when the, uh, what, the 1913 yellow fever situation hit, um, yeah. you know, and like those kinds of personal histories weren't captured in the same way that these personal histories are going to be captured now. So I just thought that was super mm. cool. Um, such a great idea and a use of... Um, you know, use of technology. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, as as a history major who who was trying to figure out what I was going to do in the world, I think she did capture it with that the history being made. I mean, ultimately, that's how I got into public sector. I yeah. I looked around and I was like, I I love history, but I don't know exactly what I am going to do with it. Um, and government struck me as a place where history is constantly being made and to yeah, be part absolutely. of it. And uh, yeah, I think it's really cool that you know History Colorado is, is looking at the pandemic in that same way, capturing the history as it's being made so that it'll be preserved and we can look back at the lessons and and uh, all be thankful that we're in a museum looking at it instead of getting to go through it again, hopefully. Right? Exactly, it's, exactly right. <laughs> I think we're all... I think we're all ready to get past this. So yes, I, I'm yeah. totally ready for this to be over. <laughs> yeah, especially I want to do these interviews someday live in person instead of uh, always in remote locations. So I know yeah. that would be awesome. That would be awesome. <laughs> right. All right. Hey, thanks again for joining us for another episode of Intentionally Left Blank, and we look forward to seeing you in the next one. Yeah, thanks so much for watching uh, this week's episode. Thanks again to Shannon for spending some time with us and giving her insights. Um, as always, same drill. If you have any comments or questions, fill those in the comment section below or in the community of interest comment section where we're happy to talk and engage there as well. Um, but yeah, until next time, we'll see you around. Nice, you didn't reiterate. Nice job. <laughs> yes! I didn't, I didn't try to summarize. Um, but yeah, until next time, we'll see you around. <laughs> right on. Perfect. <laughs>